Hey, for those of you who were alive back in the 80s, buying records, tapes, maybe even 8-tracks, you're going to really have fun with this video. I, as a lot of you know that follow this channel, I'm a big record collector. I've got thousands of, of albums out in the front of the studio. And I, one of the things we do here in the studio is we take old audio and videotapes and turn them into digital. So I'm really, really into anything like traditional media wise. And I found this really cool article that, that if you were alive and, and buying these things back at that time, this is going to be really fun for you to listen to. This is, it, it's, it's something I found in a newspaper and it's from 1982, January 23rd of 1982, the Grand Rapids Press. And somebody wrote an article here about the pricing on albums. And just reading this now and thinking back to this time is so fascinating. And so I, what I want to do is I'm just going to share this article with you. I actually haven't read the entire thing. I've only glanced through it. So we're going to be kind of experiencing this together. And anyway, I think you're going to get what I have read in this. I think you're going to love it. So anyway, the article again is called Album Pricing Troubles Dealers and uh, Grand Rapids Press. Okay. Sales of albums and tapes are still going strong despite a poor economy and rising music prices. Again, this is 1982, beginning of the year. But an uncertain economic future and possible cost increases could change that, according to some area record dealers. Quote, in general, prices are going up, said Mike Kroll, the display coordinator at Crazy Larry's Kentwood Store, 3850 28th Street, Southeast. The next big cost jump is likely to be the standard list price for albums, now $8.98, according to Kroll. What the consumer pays may vary from store to store. Now, that's interesting because I started really, really buying records pretty heavily in that right around this time. And it might have been 83, 84 when I was really buying them a lot. But they were $7.99, as I recall. And here they're saying in 82, at least in this location, they were $8.98. So that was about a dollar more than how I remember it. Uh, we will see some of some $9.98 lists by the end of the year, he said. Whether or not the industry goes for it, the price increase, that is, is dependent on how the economy goes. We're hoping it'll stay around eight. Beyond that, what they, record companies, are doing with the older catalogs or the older inventories is demoting them from $8.98 to $5.98, Kroll continued. So in that aspect, prices are coming down. Now, I actually remember when I would buy records, every once in a while, you would find a lot of records, and, and they probably were those that weren't selling very well, would be, they would be like five ninety eight. dollars So anyway, that's kind of interesting to hear them talking about that, demoting them from eight ninety eight dollars to five ninety eight. dollars uh, Old doesn't necessarily mean hit parade golden oldies, though. Record labels will lower the price of an album when they obtain its copyright from the artist. Examples include early works of The Doors, Ted Nugent, and Genesis. That's pretty interesting. Cole attributes interesting, or increasing sales to such price reductions, as well as recent periods with plenty of new releases. And that's kind of interesting because I would periodically buy something, even if I wouldn't have purchased it for the $7.99 or $8.99, whatever, if it were inexpensive enough, like five ninety eight or six ninety eight, I'd be more likely to give it a chance. And I've noticed that even in recent years, uh, when I'd be walking through Walmart at some point, you know, a decade or more back with my kids, and I'd see a, a CD there of some artist I'd always been kind of curious about, but it'd have this like best of. I can't remember what they were called, but they were only like five bucks. Like, you know what? I want to listen to that. And I actually discovered a few things I really liked just because it was kind of inexpensive. And I thought, nah, give it a shot. So that's kind of interesting. Let's see. The price cuts are possible in some cases. Uh, oh, I already read that. List prices averaging $9.98 are not an inevitable situation, at least if recession ends, according to Kroll. But he believes indications point in that direction. Singles have also experienced recent cost increases, according to Kathy Wamhoff, manager of Record Land in North Kent Mall. They now average $1.60 in price. That's really interesting. So singles, the, we're talking about 45s here. And 
when I I actually have about four or five hundred forty fives in my collection, and I remember them costing a dollar ninety nine. I don't remember them costing ninety nine cents. Um, I don't remember them costing a buck sixty. I remember them costing a dollar ninety nine. So actually, he mentions the ninety nine cents here. Forty five stayed at the same price, around ninety nine cents for a period of several years. Says Wamhoff, they've been raising forty fives approximately a dime a year or so over the last five years. But that's just inflation. It's difficult to predict just how fast record prices will continue to escalate. No one seems to think they're going to come down. It depends upon the economy, she said. Since vinyl is a petroleum product, costs have gone up with that. And transportation costs have certainly entered into it. You have to truck albums from place to place just like everything else. So uh, naturally, the cost of uh, transportation goes up, price of everything goes up. Despite high list prices on new albums, Wamhoff believes people can still afford to make music purchases. Quote, there are always sales and specials and a lot of people buy the older catalogs, she added. They may have always wanted it and never picked it up or their first copy is worn out. They can pick those up at a lower price than they originally could. Now, this is interesting. So I want to ask you, first of all, those of you that used to buy records and tapes, how many of you actually bought it in multiple formats. In other words, you bought a record, the record started wearing down, so you went and bought a tape. Or did you do what a lot of people did and put a cassette in? I actually did this a lot. I'd buy a record and the first thing I would do in many cases is put a cassette in and just record the record so I didn't play the record more than once. That I actually did that quite a few times with, with albums. So anyway, I'm just curious if you had an experience like that. Uh, I'm sure that some people aren't buying albums because of the cost, but our sales aren't down, they're up. Although probably most noticeable to the consumer, costs aren't the only thing on the rise. Sound quality is improving as new recording methods are quietly being developed by industry technicians. And then, quote, there are some new processes being put, um, albums that haven't been before, according to Kroll. Digital recording, for example, is done on computer tape, which each frequency given a numerical code, a master is made from this, which is used to press the vinyl copies sold to the public. Now, this is really interesting because this is the beginning of the CD, right around, right? Because here we are in 1982. Not very many people had CD players back then. I actually got mine not long after this. I'm curious, when did you get your first CD player, by the way? Throw that in the comments. But they were, this is such an interesting thing, and I think I've talked about this in other videos, but you, the so many people talk about the warmth, quote unquote, warmth of analog, especially a record, but if that came from a digital source rather than an analog source, which is what was starting to happen back then, you didn't really, you weren't necessarily preserving that warmth, quote unquote. Like I, like I said, because this was starting to come in. People were, it wasn't really, really common, but some people were starting to see the, the digital recordings being put on the, the record, which is, of course, everything today. When you buy something on a record, I'd say that 99.9% .9 of it was recorded digitally in the very first place. And then the vinyl itself kind of becomes more of a novelty just having, having it rather than... Okay, anyway, so digital recording, for example, computer tape. It delivers a cleaner, more accurate recording, he said, and happily, it hasn't required a price increase. Now, this is so interesting because you'll remember this and comment on this because I'm sure I'm not the only person that remembers this. When CDs came in, what was the first thing they did with the CDs as far as price goes? They raised them so high. And I think part of it was because of what we're reading in this article. Because, there was, because the record company obviously wants to raise the prices. They just want to put prices up. They want to go from, if you watch the, the video we did on the album Presence a few days ago, I think that they were listing the albums as being sold for $3.97. And this was in their early 70s, mid 70s, actually, sorry. But then by the time you got to the early 80s, it wasn't $3.97 or $4.97 or $5 or $6. It was actually up into the $8 range at that point. And, and that was way, I think, I, that had to be beyond what re inflation was, wasn't it? Back, actually, inflation was a lot then. But, but that's not the point. The point is, the, the record companies like anybody else want to be able to raise the prices, want to be able to make more money out of it. And then when the CD got introduced, what did they do? 
instead of $7.99 for a CD, now all of a sudden those CDs were $17, $18, twice if not more than two times more than the records were. Do you remember this? And then what did they tell us? Oh, this is just new technology and the price is going to go down eventually. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but did the price ever go down? No, maybe a dollar, but, it, but they kept it as high as they could. The CD really, in the end, was little more than an excuse for the record companies to raise the prices. Like this article where they were having a very, very hard time getting the public to, to just go along with these constant price increases, which is because what they wanted to keep doing over and over and over again. They, they would have loved for records to be $17, $18 a piece, but there's no way we would have done it. So they introduced this new thing called the CD, and I'm not going to knock it. I bought CDs, and I love the, the cleanness of the sound, etc. But that was an, a way for them to get the price up. Now, now I don't know if you've noticed this, how much <laughs> records are today. This is what they would have really loved them to have been way back then, you know, up in the $30 range for, for a record. Okay, anyway, I didn't mean to get off on that, but I'm sure you remember this. And, how, and by the way, what do you remember? When you first bu started buying CDs, how much were they? I remember them being 14, 15, 16, even more dollars, uh, even when the prices came down. I, uh, I made a video a few days ago that some of you probably watched about Dark Side of the Moon. And that was one of the first CDs I bought. And I, I think I spent $16 on that thing. Maybe more. Anyway, okay, it delivers a cleaner, more accurate recording. And that's, by the way, that's arguable. There, there are audiophiles that'll, that'll argue with that statement, but, and it hasn't required a price increase. More evident are changes in the, for, uh, in the form in which people are buying their music. Kroll sees a, quote, large shift occurring on sales toward cassettes, and the days of the eight-track tape are numbered, if not over. And I, I have a, a, vi a video on this channel that I put out probably seven years ago called Why is an 8-Track Tape called an 8-Track Tape? And if you haven't watched it, you should watch it. It's I, I, We have like 80,000 views on that video just because it's kind of a fascinating thing if you don't know why it's called that. But it was that was the... There have been a lot of bad formats over the years. That was the worst format ever created. Uh, and and, and uh, anyway, I have a ton of experience with those. I have an eight track player here, a bunch of eight tracks, but it's terrible. It was a terrible format. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to make a video one of these days where we take one apart to show you what's inside because it was it's it's like the guy that made de designed it was some sort of a crazy mad scientist. It's so bizarre how the thing works. Okay, uh, if not over eight tracks are non existent format, he said. And by 80, 82, yeah, they were well on the way out of knock on the music industry has recognized the demise of eight track which has prompted changes in the way sales are handled the record companies especially motown are beginning a one-way policy on eight tracks the stores buy it but they won't take it back so that was a, a thing that happened a lot of times back then is that they would send records to a store with these guarantees that if they didn't sell that the record company would would take them back and then the eight tracks are like we're not taking those things the return policies of most record companies allow them to buy back defective overbought items for the original price at no loss to the dealer. Yeah, just like I just said. Now with the exception of 8-track tapes. Some labels, such as Warner Brothers, accept 8-track returns, but for less than the original cost. Motown is the first to flatly refuse them. Quote, this means that in the future, we will severely limit our 8-track buying from Motown, said Kroll. And as other labels go... To the, and as other labels go to this, we will probably only special order 8-tracks, unquote. That leaves consumers, albums, and cassettes to choose from, each having certain advantages and disadvantages. Kroll feels albums are generally more durable than cassettes and give slightly better sound quality depending upon care and maintenance. And by the way, uh, uh, those of you that... Uh, anyway, I'm actually curious how many of you still buy records or have your old collections. It really had so much to do of course, with care and maintenance as far if it sounded be better than a cassette. But it also depended on something else. It depended on the needle, the stylus that you bought. That, that could make a huge difference in how good a record sounds. It, it, what, one of the problems with a lot of us that had records back in the 80s, a lot of people, is they go, well, it doesn't, it doesn't sound as good as a CD. Well, part of the reason is, is that your equipment was junk. 
and and a record was just never going to sound good on the needle that you had, the stylus that you had. It just wasn't ever going to really sound good. And so you were blown away when the CD came out. But your record, other than the little pops and scratches, didn't sound all that different than a CD if you spent enough money on the equipment. And that was the problem. Uh, you know, a CD player you could buy for relatively inexpensive and get great sound quality out of it. To get the same thing out of a record, you really needed to put some money into it. And a lot of people just really weren't, weren't willing to do that. Okay, another album advantage is that if the listener wants a cassette copy, one easily can be made from the record. In numbers, albums still reign supreme in sales. But you can't play an album in a car or carry one in your pocket. The convenience of cassettes often outweighs album advantages for music buyers, according to Kroll, and cassette sales are, quote, moving up very quickly. They're also going to capture the 8-track market, he added. While pre-recorded tapes move in to fill the void left by 8-track, blank tapes are becoming an increasingly popular way to beat costs, according to Recordland manager Wamhoff. Depending on quality, type, and brand name, blank cassettes range in price from $1.75 to $11. Boy, that's interesting to hear, isn't it? I'm curious, how much do you remember cassette tapes costing? And it it really also depended on the quality of the tape, too, because you could buy junk, you know, in at Kmart, you could buy a little their house brand tapes, which are just kind of garbage. Or you could go buy a really nice t- TDK, Maxell, etc. With the right equipment, one can record albums borrowed from friends or libraries with excellent reproduction. But when it's not available from the sources, some turn to the record store. As long as the new recordings are not sold commercially, it is legal, according to Wamhoff. Um, yeah, that's uh, th- th- that's really complicated. And it became more complicated in the 90s. There's a whole bunch of legal things about that. But because some buy albums simply to tape and return them, record outlets have been forced to alter return policies. Typically, cash refunds are not given, as at Recordland. Usually, just defectives are replaced and then exchanged only for the same title. Uh, I'm curious how many people out there have ha- had a, an experience with that. That is, a quote, that is necessary to protect the artist and the industry, says Wim Hof. Otherwise, somebody is getting free goods. Uh, And I'm actually curious how many of you, speaking of this, did maybe not buy the record to make a copy and then take the record back, but would just borrow one from a friend. Say, I want to borrow those records, take them home, record them on a tape, and then give them back to your friend. I don't look at at them as crooks, said Wemhoff. They're just trying to beat the system in a way they, in any way they can, and we have to eliminate that because that's our loss. And anyway, this was the... It was kind of the Napster version, the 80s version of Napster, what we were doing back then. Uh, the difference was when you did record it to a tape, you would it would degrade a little bit. Uh, most of us didn't care, but it definitely degraded. Anyway, that's that's the end of the article. But I think that was so interesting listening to uh, to this stuff, how these things how these things changed over time and what those formats were like. And so I'd love to get your comments. Do you remember having those formats? Did you have eight track tapes? Did you have cassette tapes? Did you buy them? Did you record them off your friends? Did you buy records? And how did those records last? Do you still have them? Uh, I'd love to hear about that stuff. And also, are you buying records today? Hey, thanks for, please, please uh, follow the channel, obviously. Thanks for watching the video. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and always, as always, leave comments on these things. And if you're watching this, you probably know somebody else <laughs> that lived through that same period. Please share this with your friends. Put it on Facebook, share it on your other social media, message it to people, because I think other people really enjoy watching this stuff too. Anyway, with that, have yourself a fantastic day. Mm-hmm.